So uh, promising practices and barriers to help seeking in severe cases of domestic violence in the Maritimes, findings from the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative with Vulnerable Populations. Mary is a PhD, uh, Mary Aspinall is an assistant professor at St. Thomas University. Her research interests are intimate partner violence and therapeutic jurisprudence. She previously worked at the YMCA, Isabel Johnson Women's Shelter, and as a domestic violence victim caseworker at Family Violence Services Regina. She also served as a panel member for the Saskatchewan Domestic Violence Death Review until her relocation to New Brunswick. And Mary has done several presentations for us through the Muriel Queen Ferguson Center and has, built, has had a longstanding relationship. So Mary, thank you so much for coming to give a presentation today. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I've really been bouncing around UMB, the MMFC, now it's Stu, so <laughs> I think I've met most of you at some point or another. Um, so I hope you're still very interested in the CDHPI data following Mamie and Kathy's presentation. Um, you will be well versed in this by the time you leave, as I'm also presenting some research uh, based on those interview transcripts. Uh, admittedly, some of this will sound like a bit of a recap of what we heard earlier uh, in terms of some of the research uh, that I'm presenting and some of the transcripts that um, Diane and I, um, I'll mention her in a moment, that we were looking at. Uh, some of them likely did overlap with the rural participants that you were also considering, um, but I see this as a positive thing that uh, we had similar findings and identified similar themes. So. <laughs> This is all good. Um, so this project I've been doing with Diane Crocker. She was unfortunately unable to travel here from Halifax today to co-present with me, um, but her and I have been doing a little bit of work together uh, in between when I finished my PhD and before I started my new position at STU. Uh, the work that we were doing with the CDHPI data, um, it was actually initially part of um, in addition, I'll say, to some other evaluation-based work that Diane and I were doing in Nova Scotia. Um, we've kind of, from there, built this into its own little side project uh, with that data. So some of this you've heard already. <laughs> Um, but the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative with Vulnerable Populations, uh, this was a, a five-year SHRC-funded research project that was led by Dr. Myrna Dawson and Dr. Peter Jaffe in Ontario. Uh, Diane was a co-investigator on this project, and as Kathy introduced me somewhat earlier, I was a research assistant and PhD student on the project at the time. Uh, so this initiative uh, really concentrated on identifying uh, emerging risk assessment, risk management, and safety planning strategies to try and inform promising practices in domestic homicide prevention. It also concentrated on the unique needs of four vulnerable populations, uh, specifically Indigenous, uh, immigrant refugee, those living in rural, remote, or northern regions, and children exposed to domestic violence, which I think Kathy also highlighted earlier. Uh, so one of the later stages, uh, phase three of this national research was to conduct the interviews with both survivors of severe domestic violence, as well as proxies, so it could be family, friends, or others that were very close to someone who had been killed in the context of domestic homicide. And so through Diane and I's uh, idea about what we could do with some of this data, uh, we were really concentrating on what has or what's been going on in the Maritimes, what the survivors and proxies in the Maritime uh, location uh, were talking about. Uh, we're really interested for the other work that we were doing that this then was informing, uh, what kind of barriers are in existence um, out in the Maritime region, what options are available, what's not available uh, for this particular population. So we were including interviews uh, from all of the vulnerable populations as long as they were in the Maritimes. <laughs> 
Um, so when we were pulling those particular transcripts, uh, we ended up with 21 transcripts uh, from either uh, survivors or proxies. Uh, so there are nine of them were survivors and 12 of them were proxies. So again, could be family, friends, uh, and so on. We're both moving, okay, good. <laughs> And so in terms of how the interviews themselves, uh, when the CDHPI was underway, um, the interview guides really took an ethnographic approach. And if Diane were here, she could go into far more detail about that as she was involved in the initial development of the interview guides. But this approach, this ethnographic approach, it really aimed to get much deeper descriptions rather than very specific opinions or explanations or an analysis of a very particular context. So the questions were asked to participants, uh, they were very open ended, and they were asked to share their stories uh, without the interviews really probing for a specific list of items. And so doing it this way, it allows for the participants to truly reflect on and share their experiences and describe what their efforts may have been, or what the perception the proxy had of uh, the deceased's efforts uh, to try and assess and manage their level of risk. So, for example, one of the questions uh, may have been phrased uh, like, I'd like you to think of a time that you did not feel safe in your relationship, and what did you do? It's very open-ended, um, not a very leading question. So it's allowing the participant to select their own stories, what's most important for them, um, and what they think is most uh, imperative that they share. So when we were recently analyzing some of these transcripts, uh, we took a more narrative approach to that. Um, so we were looking for themes from the participants, also comparing those themes with narratives from other survivors or proxies, uh, and especially identifying any markers of salience. So this would be uh, primacy and frequency. Um, with, with a narrative analysis uh, where participants are tending to start. Where does their story begin or what do they feel is the most important um, or what do they talk about most often? So when I refer to primacy and frequency, we're thinking about those kind of ideas. Again, there's a little bit more of a summary from earlier, um, but just to talk a little bit more about the participants themselves. Uh, so first, I will just re-highlight the eligibility criteria for participants to take part in an interview. Uh, so anyone that we did interview had to be 18 or older at the time of doing that interview. They did have to identify that they were currently safe from any violence and abuse. Their experiences um, were anticipated to have taken place between uh, 2006 and 2016. They also had to be willing to have their interviews audio recorded so that we could transcribe them. And we asked screening questions initially to ensure that we were including participants from the four identified vulnerable populations. And there could not be any ongoing criminal justice system proceedings. In terms of what you have on the right side of your slide, uh, the interviews that Diane and I were analyzing more in depth. So I can give you a little bit of a breakdown of some of the context of those participants. So most of the 12 proxies that we had in our sample, uh, they were directly related to the victim, uh, like a sibling, uh, a parent, um, or an adult child uh, of a parent who had been killed. Most of the violent incidents that we did end up hearing about um, or where the homicides did take place uh, often happened in rural areas of our Eastern provinces. Not likely very surprising. We have a lot of rural areas in the Maritimes and our presentation earlier really captured some of this as well. Uh, the relationships, uh, I guess the context of the relationship where a lot of this took place, uh, many were happening in what had been long-term relationships or marriages, a few dating relationships, um, but also some common law partnerships as well. 
Um, what we also saw in going through some of these transcripts as well was in a number of situations, um, either reported by the survivor or talked about by the proxy, there had been several attempts made to try and leave the relationship um, and often yeah, multiple, multiple attempts. And several of the perpetrators in these situations had been charged at some point with criminal offenses and had previously or were currently serving custodial sentences, and one of them had committed suicide. So the part you're probably most interested in. <laughs> So I share some various quotes and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about the various themes that we have identified so far. Um, these quotes, these narratives are not exhaustive of all the wonderful quotes that we found to really support our themes, but hopefully a little interesting for you. But again, to reiterate something we heard earlier, uh, lots of conversation about shelters. Uh, this was indeed one of the first stories that came to mind for many of the participants. And so this was, uh, I would say, our most prominent finding. And so we broke this down into, I guess, two mini themes within this. Uh, one where there were very positive characteristics, ways in which shelters uh, really ensured someone's safety and security. But then we also did hear a few aspects around some more negative characteristics of shelters or some of the downside to them. So we broke it down by that. In terms of the positive aspects, uh, participants did highlight that shelters were often a very positive experience. They were able to provide a very wide range of supports and services. So this included things like frequent meetings with the residents of the shelter, um, offering various types of programming, uh, whether it was around mindfulness, um, somebody mentioned trauma, um, and even how to manage finances. Uh, we also saw that coming up. They talk about how there were lots of toys for the kids, lots of attention and supervision allocated to the children. Um, staff would help residents attend various appointments. They'd help them speak to the police, social services, whatever that might be, and just generally be a strong advocate for them. We also heard and read the participants highlighting that they really felt the shelters were unconditional in their supports. Even after a woman had left, she could still call the staff with questions if she just needed to run something by them or get some extra support and as well could return to the shelters multiple times if uh, she continued to need to seek safety. Now, the negative characteristics that we did pull most often, they weren't necessarily criticizing any particular staff or any particular program or a particular shelter in general, but more so recognizing that there are some larger challenges that shelters might be facing. Um, one of these, of course, is capacity issues. Um, there was some discussion about the reality that um, many shelters uh, will often have to turn people away because they're full. Uh, this was noted uh, from our participants as well. Uh, what we also heard was that sometimes that can lead to um, unintentional um, I don't want to say attitudes of shelter staff, but how can we get someone in and out as quickly as possible because we have to make room for new people. Um, so we had some participants indicate feeling a bit rushed. How can we get you out of here? Um, and we also heard comments that shelters can be very under resourced sometimes, especially in more rural areas and very underfunded. Um, but again, it wasn't the participants saying that they did not particularly like a shelter, they saw the restraints that the staff had to work within. So another very frequent discussion point was around the challenges and the barriers to seeking, seeking safety. And so we broke this down into three separate sections. Um, so there's isolation and control, barriers to leaving, and then yes, a bit of a summary again about what you heard earlier, uh, barriers that are very specific to rural communities. <clears throat> 
The survivors, especially, they often talked in depth about the tactics that their abuser, yeah, their abuser would take to ensure that they were dependent on them for everything. Um, there was a high level of control in the relationship, lots of manipulation happening, and often an inability to be able to reach out for support or even talk to other people. Um, as highlighted in the quote you have on the left there, uh, this particular perpetrator would leave the survivor with little food, no transportation, no money, um, living in a very rural and isolated area, uh, while he went away for weeks at a time. Um, and so this also highlights as well for us that control and isolation can absolutely persist, even if the perpetrator is not physically near their target. The survivors also talked about times where, uh, for example, she just wanted to go and take a walk, clear her head, go for a drive. The perpetrator would not let her No, I'll come with you. No, I'll take you. Um, always had to know her whereabouts. Uh, some other narratives included describing how the perpetrator would take issue with other people being in the survivor's life to a point where it just felt easier to cut ties uh, with their friends or their family or whoever that might be uh, to try and placate the abuser or at least try to eliminate some of the repercussions of their jealousy and one of the survivors did say that looking back at the situation now that they were out of that, um, that they could see that these were very intentional maneuvers by the perpetrator to try and put those walls up and increase their isolation. So this isolation and high level of control is for sure one barrier that does prevent someone from being able to leave or access resources. Um, but additionally, the participants also highlighted some other barriers, uh, like the effects of the violence and the control that really chips away at their self-esteem, uh, destroys their confidence, eliminates their sense of autonomy. Um, so it's hard to even think about how to try and leave or how to access supports um, because it, they've just been chipped away at for so long. Um, they also reported feeling like no one will believe me if I tell somebody what's going on. We heard that earlier as well. Um, or they were concerned that others might think they were exaggerating if they went into any detail about what they were experiencing. The financial aspect of leaving. Again, we heard this earlier, lots of overlap here, uh, but this was a big piece uh, of this as well. Um, either why participants or the survivors felt like they couldn't leave or that they were forced to return to that relationship if they had tried to leave. Uh, that perpetrator had often been their source of financial support. They'd been their transportation. Uh, they'd paid the bills. They'd put food on the table and some felt like it was near, if not impossible, to do that on their own if they did try and leave, especially coupled with the fact that they'd been so isolated and controlled earlier, they did not have those other personal supports. But it wasn't just about the specific tactics of the perpetrator where some of this uh, financial challenge came in as well. Uh, we also did hear and read that there could be some system restrictions, uh, such as being required to have a residence or an address in order to apply for social assistance. I don't know if this is the case everywhere, but at least in some jurisdictions, it sounds like it because we heard this complaint. Um, but then it's a bit of a vicious cycle, right? You can't get assistance until you have a residence. You can't get a residence until you have resources and it just goes around and around. And as I indicated earlier, uh, the maritime provinces of course have many rural areas. So it was not a surprise that we did see some specific barriers being attached to this as well. Uh, in some very remote locations, um, it might be hard for others to even identify that some isolation is happening with your neighbors because you might just live so far apart from everyone that no one sees you anyway. Uh, participants also described as well the alternative. There's very close-knit relationships in some rural communities as well, where everybody knows everybody, including the perpetrator. And so some also expressed some stories 
where the perpetrator's violence and aggression was very well known in the community, but this actually contributed to others like again, we heard earlier, I'm repeating, uh, being afraid to intervene or reach out for fear of their own safety and repercussions against themselves if that perpetrator knew that they were involved. And another barrier here that came up for rural communities was in terms of the timing that it can take emergency services to access them. Uh, one described that the police were at least 10 minutes away um, and for many others, it could be much, much longer than that. And so they said that this could actually give the perpetrator a known window of time. They know what they can do because they know how long it's going to take uh, police, for example, to arrive on scene. So those were the most prominent, the most frequent themes that came up out of these interviews, um, but there were a few other aspects that uh, we did want to highlight, and some of them do uh, interconnect with each other a little bit. Um, but these weren't necessarily at the forefront of all the participants' minds or the very first story that they were talking about. But we did notice as we were reading through the transcripts that these kind of things came up time and time again. It might have been later on in the conversation, but they were still things that participants were talking about. And one of these was that there does seem to be a preference that people seem to have to reach out and talk to their informal supports as long as they're still in contact with their informal supports over reporting things to formal systems like police, hospitals, social services, and so on. Uh, we were hearing and reading that when survivors or those that before being killed had tried to reach out for help, they were more likely to be discussing their concerns with their family, with their friends, um, with their neighbors, and even in some cases with their coworkers. And we consider that this might have been happening for a few reasons. Um, one of them, their self-esteem and confidence, as I mentioned earlier, had been so chipped away and depleted that they weren't sure if their concerns were valid enough to go to the more formal systems first, get some feedback from your informal supports, see what they think before you move further with it. Uh, that was something that came up. Uh, we also learned that there might still be some misconceptions about what emergency services could actually help you with. Um, as you, yes, I did put it on here, as you see on this slide, um, this was a family member of someone who had ultimately been killed. Um, she was talking about how when we think of the police, we think fires and guns, uh, we think immediate crisis kind of situations. It's not necessarily someone you call if you think there might be a problem, but you're just not quite sure. Or there might also still be some beliefs that unless a very serious physical incident was happening, that there can be some reluctance potentially for some formal services to take the report seriously. And I'm going to come back to that thought in a moment. Because this does merge somewhat at least we think it does, <laughs> with another theme that we found here, where participants were also discussing the prevalence that there still may be minimization of intimate partner violence or myths that are still prevailing about it. And that went for both informal and formal support systems. Some of the proxies especially discussed how members of our general population are still often associating intimate partner violence with a particular stigma. Uh, one of them had mentioned that they heard someone say that doesn't happen in our backyard. People are still saying this. And another, another proxy um, had been in conversation with a neighbor of the person who was deceased and learned after the fact that this proxy had said um, they did suspect or the neighbor suspected something was going on, but it's not my business. Um, so there are still some attitudes like that, unfortunately. Um, but it also does go for people in professional positions as well. We did hear some comments about some neg negative experiences and interactions with other systems. Um, someone was hearing the phrase, why don't you just leave uh, from someone in a more formal role? 
And someone else also talked about dealing with a physician who felt was very rude to them, um, did not take their concern seriously, their injury seriously, um, because they assumed that she was just going to go back to the relationship anyway. So there were some negative perceptions of intimate partner violence victims. Just a few more to run through. Um, so again, some of this might also be connected with sometimes having the preference for some informal supports. Um, and this includes uh, some potentially rigid professional policies or the appearance, appear, I can't speak now, the appearance at least of some leniency that perpetrators uh, might be afforded. So I also wish to highlight here for the moment. We heard from survivors about the lack of urgency or the lack of seriousness that might be taken about complaints of abuse unless there was physical violence taking place. That it's not yet crisis, it's not yet an urgent situation unless that was happening or there had been evidence that that had happened. And especially for proxies, we had multiple comments where they were highlighting that unless the victim was directly reporting their own abuse, nothing can be done. A mother had encouraged her daughter to share her concerns with the local RCMP, um, but she wasn't ready to, and that's fair, not everybody is. Uh, but her understanding was that since her daughter was an adult, um, this mother could not be the one to report it. Another family member from a different case um, also mentioned that even if you do try and report concerns on behalf of someone else, unless that particular uh, victim admits what's going on and also corroborates your own complaint about their situation, again, things tend to fall flat. In terms of perpetrator leniency, Many of the proxies and their survivors discuss their opinions, especially around the effectiveness of restraining orders um, or having those non-contact and non-attend conditions in place. Uh, perpetrators had been described as driving up and down the street when these kind of conditions were currently in place, but not getting close enough to the residents that the police uh, could actually or were able or willing to do anything about that. Others also discussed that uh, requesting an order like this could in fact, or they believed it could make the abuse much worse. Uh, the perpetrator, uh, they were afraid they were going to retaliate uh, if this kind of order was requested. Um, and there was also comments that these are just a piece of paper. It's not going to stop anyone who is determined to continue their abuse. So these are some of the thoughts around uh, those particular kind of orders. But others also felt as well, like sentences that are given for intimate partner violence are not serious enough. Uh, we heard a lot about this as well. Um, as you have here, someone compared it to harm to wildlife. Uh, you can poach a moose and you get a higher punishment than if you were to assault your spouse. Uh, we also heard that there is perceptions that jail seems to be a last resort and that perpetrators are given multiple or too many chances in their perspectives uh, before this kind of penalty is imposed. So again, it appears that uh, potentially a preference to reach out to informal supports first could also be tied to some of these uh, considerations or some of these experiences or perceptions about intimate partner violence possibly being viewed at as a lesser type of crime. And even if they do report, what are the chances that it's going to be taken seriously? Are they going to be awarded enough protection? Is their safety going to be protected enough? It would appear that many people uh, don't feel very confident in those supports and services. Um, and I'd mentioned earlier in terms of some of the uh, participant uh, 
the relationship demographics. Um, but I mentioned that the perpetrators had served sentences. So I guess just to flip back to that and, and clarify that, uh, these could have been shorter sentences that they might have had earlier, but that others felt that they weren't long enough, they weren't severe enough for what the crime had actually been. Um, or for those that were serving custodial sentences, these were often now after there had in fact been a homicide. So kind of tying into some of their thoughts that unless something very serious like a murder happens, um, they're not being incarcerated. And so just one of the last parts I want to mention, um, it comes up a lot. Again, it came up earlier. I hear this time and time again, um, doing research and working in this field, but there are many suggestions. Um, so not just coming from rural participants, but across all other populations as well. We need more education and we need more awareness about these kind of issues. And it's not just learning more about what the signs of intimate partner violence are, what the various tactics of it might be, but we also heard suggestions this needs to include, you know, what does a healthy relationship look like? What does respect look like? What does consent look like? Um, not just focusing on the violence and abuse uh, specifically. And these participants reiterated that this should be in schools from elementary level all the way through university. Uh, there should be age appropriate information. Um, I would say mandated is that they felt very strongly about that, that we need this as part of our curriculum. Uh, we also heard that there needs to be ongoing training not just for other professionals that are currently in this kind of field, although they were suggesting that that would be a good idea to continue as well, but also reach all other types of employers and workplaces, um, some of which I know that we are doing right now, um, but to recognize the fact that violence and abuse does happen everywhere and it does impact everybody. So just to wrap that up and then I'll take some questions. Um, whenever I talk about doing this kind of research, I always like to start my conclusion, I'll say, by really commending the participants of this research, um, being brave and willing to come forward with their stories. Um, as one of the research assistants that actually conducted some of these interviews, um, it was a real privilege and an honor to be able to carry their stories and sit with them to do that. So in summary, it is clear to us, and again, we heard earlier, shelters are considered a huge source of support uh, when they are accessible. Uh, we heard many stories of supportive staff, helpful programs, and especially the non-judgmental and unconditional nature of many of their services. Uh, this was often contrasted with other professional services where we were hearing a little bit more of the opposite, that there were more rigid rules, uh, rigid policies to follow, and sometimes a lack of uh, trauma-informed training. Um, so we know that there are some further efforts being made to try and increase public knowledge and awareness of intimate partner violence and services, but we do also consider some of the systemic isolation that is performed by these perpetrators, ensuring that the victims, even if the information's out there, they can't access it. Um, one of the proxies, uh, very perfectly summarized uh, in their transcript, even if something is on TV, even if it's on the radio, even if the information is out there, it, it's not always going to work as we have it right now because there is so much isolation and control happening. Um, so, I was, this, I was gonna say something about that. <laughs> Come back to my other point in a second. Um, but I also talked about some of the criticisms of professional services. We heard complaints about the criminal justice system. That was not at all surprising to us. Um, but I will say there were a few positive stories that did come out about some helpful police interaction or a good system response. Unfortunately, there just were not that many of them in our review to really create an entire theme around that. Um, but 
we do raise the importance for these formal systems to think about taking more collaborative approaches, um, trauma-informed training, um, and maybe increase some of the flexibility where possible about some of their policies. Um, we know that there are some places that are working in this way, uh, but based on what we're hearing from participants, it just doesn't seem to be widespread enough. Um, and so a possible solution to that could be something that was raised earlier about that collaboration between police and community services. Um, and trying to uh, provide support that way. Um, I would be on board with that. <laughs> Um, and lastly, we do also continue to see evidence that intimate partner violence is, is not an individual isolated problem. Um, preaching to the choir here probably, but it is still a very social issue uh, and we still need to do more work in terms of shifting perspectives and attitudes of societies and communities overall. Um, I know us here, we know the issues, um, but we're still hearing a lot of uh, that minimization, those stereotypes about intimate partner violence. And so it's clear that this is a problem with our larger community that we are still facing. I forgot to put a thank you slide at the end, but that will uh, wrap that up. Thank you so much.